One of the most frequent questions I get is how to build templates in Cubase that utilize Contact 6, and what are the different approaches and the pros and cons for those different approaches. So I'm gonna try and cover this in a couple of different videos to give you guys a bit of an insight on how you can go about building templates. So let's take a look at the first method of what I call racks and MIDI tracks. For this method, we'll be utilizing the VSTi rack of Cubase and creating MIDI channels to control the various patches for each instance of contact we have loaded up into the rack. What's great about this method is that it provides you the most flexibility when it comes to setting up your routing for microphones and outputs. And generally speaking, is the method that I kind of lean towards more. Although it does take a little bit of time to set up, it does offer you more control in the long run. So instead of creating an instrument track, what we need to do is right click and add a rack instrument. And the reason we're going to be using rack instruments over instrument tracks is it's just going to save a couple of minor frustrations when it comes to naming things. So if we go add rack instrument and then select contact, you can type it in and it'll come up in the window here. Now, this will want to create a MIDI channel by default, which we can do, not a problem. And then if we expand contact by clicking on the E or pr pressing the short key, if you've set one up, uh, we can now think about loading in our patches for our template. For this one in particular, I'm going to be using Metropolis Art 1, just because I love this library by Orchestral Tools, very good library. And... Um, the first set of patches we're going to load in are from the low strings. So these are all the single articulations for the low string orchestra. So I'm going to go ahead and drag and drop these into the rack here for contact. Now, while this is loading, what we can do is start creating the MIDI channels to control all of these individual patches. So to do this, we're just going to go back to that MIDI channel up here that says contact one, right click on it, add track, add MIDI track and we're going to add another 11 MIDI channels because we've already got one instance here and that will equate to 12. Now by default if we start playing notes on these um, MIDI channels they're all going to be controlling the individual instances here of the different patches. So first let me just shrink these down. Okay so for example if I play something on channel 1 you'll see it's triggering patch one. And if I play something on channel two, it's triggering patch two. And you can see the MIDI channels as well on Cubase, uh, the numbers for them, they're also listed in the inspector here. So you know what patch is triggering what. And the MIDI channel is also listed here as well. Now by default, every patch that you load up in this way is allocated an output, which is stereo one. They all share the first available output. Now, one of the methods people tend to like doing is that they like to have each patch have its own channel in the mixer, and then from within the software, they blend the microphone positions. However, I don't recommend taking that approach when building a template using this method because you'll be doubling up on your naming scheme for things. For example, if we want to say we've got things named here in, in, on, on the MIDI channels, if we were then to create an audio output, we'd also need to name the audio output the same as the patch so we know what we're controlling in the mixer. And that means you're just going to be doubling up the amount of things that you need to copy and paste and type in X, Y, Z. So I wouldn't recommend doing that using this method. This method is much better for controlling the orchestra and having you know full control over the different microphone positions. So it makes life much easier. So what I'm going to do is assign each microphone position of this library to its own output. And because it's all coming from the same section of an orchestra, that means I only really need to use four channels in the mixer. So I'm going to activate the outputs here for a couple of the patches. And then what I'm going to go do is name the four channels in the mixer. So this one is going to be the close mics. This one is going to be tree, ambient, and surround. Okay. Now, if we go back to our patches here, we now need to route these to their respective channels. Obviously, the first one we don't need to worry about because that's already defaulted to channel one and two. 
um, but the others we need to change. So I'm going to select Stereo 2, uh, and then you'll see the text will change so we can make sure we're connecting to the right ones. I've actually named these wrong. That should be A, B, <laughs> that should be Tree, so let's do that again. So that's going to uh, that one, that one's going to that one, and that one's going to that one. It is a little bit buggy sometimes, the text. It does need to refresh. Um, so just bear that in mind. And then go down here, do the same for this one. And we'll do it for this one Oops, as well. So what this means is that in Cubase, we'll be getting four channels to control the different microphone positions. Now, I won't go ahead and do it with all the patches because that will be just us sitting here for ages. The next thing we need to do is activate these channels in Cubase. So I'm going to go over to the right here in the rack, go activate outputs. Uh, let me just shrink this so you guys can see and remove that. And then just activate the first four outputs. You won't see anything in the main window unless you expand the VST instruments folder. And this will show us our instance of contact and the outputs. And what we can do is go ahead and name these. So I know this is going to be uh, the low strings part of the orchestra because we've got all the articulations loaded up. So that's going to help me when I look at it. And now we just need to name our microphone positions in the mixer. So close, uh, AB, tree, surround. And what we can do is go ahead and I'm going to rename this as well, low strings. What we can do is go ahead and select all these and give them a color. Okay. So now when we open up the mixer, let's just imagine that we've gone ahead and named all of our patches here. Um, but when we go up and open the mixer, what you'll find is that we now have our microphone positions here for the whole section of the low strings. And what I like to do is select these and then add all these to their own group channel, which is a stereo channel. And I use this as the master fader to control the entire volume of the section. So if I want to adjust the blend of the microphones, I can use these. If I want to adjust the overall volume of that section of patches, I can just use this. And, and this method is, you know, it's pretty much rinse and repeat. You do this for the whole orchestra. And how I like to do things is have an instance of contact for each section. You can load up to 64 patches in one instance of contact. However, from a performance point of view, you're kind of pigeonholing yourself if you want to freeze any sections in particular. So if you have your strings and brass in one instance of contact, you're going to be freezing all of them and you won't be able to work on the ones you want to. There are ways you can reduce the amount of RAM if you're running into RAM issues by purging all the samples. Um, or updating the sample pool. Basically, any notes that have got samples loaded on that are not being used for melodies will get unloaded, so that will lower your RAM footprint. So that's something you can get around just from within contact, and I've done a video on this in the past, which I'll probably put a link to. So that's pretty much the racks and tracks method in a nutshell. The pros for it are you have less of a CPU usage because you're using fewer instances of contact. You also have more control over routing everything and having it much more tidy in Cubase if you want to control all the various different mic positions for each section. The only real downsides to this are it can take a little bit longer for your templates to load because you can't exactly disable the tracks like you would do if you were just to insert normal instances of contact on an instrument track. And if you do decide there are particular parts or patches of the orchestra you just want to freeze, you won't be able to do it because they're all inside one instance of contact. However, you can always purge the samples to try and free up some RAM. In the next video, we'll take a look at the instrument track method, and then we'll talk about other little things like expression maps and all that kind of stuff, which I've touched on in previous videos before, but obviously this is going to be a bit more up to date for you guys. So hopefully you've enjoyed watching the video and you've learned something and you can go away and have a think about how you're going to approach your templates. If you have any questions, just be sure to leave them in the comments box below. And if I've missed anything, obviously add to the discussion um, so we can all learn.